because of some of those positions, but we are just trying to get the word out who is running and what they stand for. We stand for the right to vote. And that's why we're out today trying to register voters. I don't want to go on too long. I need to introduce some other people, but before I do, I want us all to give Diana Tarver a round of applause. Who's she for one? Who took the charge? Took charge of this. On March to the polls, she's our point person. So thank you, Diana. So I need to introduce the next person. Uh, I guess before I do that, I should say that all of you are welcome to become members of the League of Women Voters because since the 1970s, we've accepted men and women of all types and all sizes and all opinions. And uh, so we welcome your participation. And we are at www.lwbsalina.org. So, and Diana also does most of the work on our website, so uh, she's keeping us up to speed. I want to now introduce Miranda Bachman, who is with Let's Restore Humanity. So, Miranda, come on up. Give your hand. Thank you. All here for today. Um, we need to set ourselves in 1973. Alice. I'm sorry, Irene Nelson is performing Alice Paul. She's from Lindsburg. And we're setting ourselves in 1973 at the graduation of the, at the American University in Washington. Alice Paul gave a speech there in 1973. This was just three years after the 50th anniversary of the right to vote. Um, Irene is selling brace, I should say, the historic, um, I forgot the name. <laughs> Alice Paul is selling bracelets over here, and ten percent of the funds go to the educate to the Kansas League of Women Voters Education Fund. So I think that's about it, and we'll get ready for Alice Paul. Thank you all. Thank you for being here to celebrate the graduation ceremony of your family members or of yourself. I appreciate the invitation from the faculty members, the administration, and most of all from the students who wanted to hear about my journey from the past for the right to vote and the fight for equality. Thank you for the invitation to be your graduation speaker. It was some years ago that I was born in Paulsville, New Jersey, to a Quaker family who preached a course that men and women were obviously equal without any question. So when I went to Swarthmore College for my undergraduate work, I was surprised to learn that some people actually believed that men had superior rights to women. I couldn't imagine such heresy. After I graduated from Swarthmore, in my sociology and economics work, I decided I didn't want to go to work, so I went on to school. And I was able to travel to the University of Birmingham in England to complete my master's in sociology and social work. Social work was becoming a new profession in the early 1900s and I appreciated the scholarships that I got to sustain me and even though I quickly learned that I did not want to spend my life as a social worker, I appreciated being able to support myself in England with some of the work. I visited the underprivileged housing developments and was appalled at the 
poverty and the subjugation of women as they struggled to raise children that they really didn't want. They were forced to bear up to 18 children and more, and many times they hoped that the child would not survive because they couldn't afford any more children. But there was, at that time, no indication of education for physicians or consumers about family planning. Margaret Sanger took on the issue of family planning and birth control some years later, but in 1909, that was not a choice, and physicians didn't even receive any training about it. It was after I left Birmingham University and moved to London that I really got started. It was in London, as I was sauntering down the sidewalk, I noticed a very attractive young woman standing on a soapbox with a crowd around her. I found out it was Christabel Pankhurst, the daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, the dreaded militant suffragette. I stood back in the back of the group and listened to her powerful speech and I had an argument for the vote for women. I was drawn in to understand that this was a serious move and apart from social work, it actually gave an opportunity to make change, not just nurse the victims. I waited until the crowd dispersed and I went to Christabel and asked her about her speech and what she believed. She invited me to meet her mother, Emmeline. I had heard of Emmeline as the dreaded militant, but I was eager to find out more about the organization in the English Society for the Right to Vote for Women. When I met Ermeline, I knew I had a mentor. Even though I had been raised a Quaker with aversion to anything that was violent, I listened to her argument that the suffragists had been trying to get the right to vote for many, many, many years and a couple of generations without success. Because you see, it was the men who had to vote to admit the women. And they were not about to share that power. And some of them argued that they couldn't have women with the right to vote because women would take over the government. I thought, what better equality? Well, Ermeline taught me everything I knew about demanding publicity and working the reporters so that we got the publicity to lead to the public sympathy. I learned from Ermeline how to smash windows. I had never done such a thing before as a Quaker. I learned from Emmeline to invade the speakers' houses. I remember one time I crawled on top of the roof where I knew that there was going to be an important meeting of men to talk about the government and why they should not support women and the right to vote. I remember crawling across that tiled roof. It was kind of slippery because it had rained the night before. 
but I hung on, trying not to be noticed by anybody below. I was going to address the crowd and yell at them at the loudest. I had others with me. I had met Lucy Burns, for one, who was right along beside me. We planned to cause chaos. We knew the reporters would be there, and that's what we wanted. We wanted the reporters to spread the word across England, Scotland, and Ireland about women's right to vote. Well, I slipped a little bit and caused a commotion, and the police saw me from down below and forced me to, forced all of us down. We still got some publicity, so it was worthwhile. Then we moved on. The Lord Mayor in Scotland was to address a very important meeting of men and they were watching out for us that we might sneak in with the crowds at seven o'clock. So we disguised ourselves early in the morning as cleaning ladies and marched into the building with the rest of the crew. Then we quickly hung out in closets and anywhere where we could not be discovered from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Well, the Lord Mayor went on and he waxed eloquently about the power and wisdom of men and that women were inferior. And I stood up in the middle of his speech and yelled, why not the boats for women? It caused a consternation, which we wanted, and the reporters filled their columns with our secretive invasion of their important meeting and the right for women to vote. Of course, I was dragged out. Over the period of time in England, I was jailed nine times. And I was arrested nine times and jailed seven times. So I did my right to cause any kind of commotion and publicity that was possible. The dreaded part was the forced feeding. In jail, when we went on a hunger strike, because they would not accept us as political prisoners, the jailers decided that we had to wear the garb of the prisoners and we were not even given the healthier food of the prisoners but we were given the stale leftovers the rancid meats and the rest of the meal that was unappealing so we went on a hunger strike and i helped orchestrate it I had a natural leadership ability. And so they decided that they could not have this American woman in England who had been there studying for social work die on their watch because of hunger in their prisons. So they took me in and forced fed me. Now, if you've never known what it takes to be force fed, they jump five burly men on top to hold you down, and a supposed doctor rams a stiff rubber tube through your nose and down your throat hoping it doesn't go into the lungs where you'll get pneumonia and die, but it goes into the stomach. And then they pour raw eggs and a mixture of barley broth until you want to gag and you feel like you're suffocating. That was the worst. 
I suffer to this day of a gastroenteritis from those injuries. Finally, in 1909, I left England. As I returned home, my mother looked at me and said, you are not well. Come, I'll take care of you on the farm. Our family had a farm in Paulsdale. My father had been a gentleman farmer and I gladly fell into her care. But then I quickly recovered and decided to go back. And in 1912, I finished a PhD in political issues and sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. During my graduate work, I did my dissertation on the plight of women and the inequality as opposed to the Quaker ideals. And I started to participate in the American suffragette movement. America had been trying to get the right to vote state by state by state. It was such a painful process because each state, House and Senate, had to be convinced that women could responsibly manage the right to vote. They had not had much success over 50 years. As the Western states became into the Union, they demanded that entrance to the Union would permit them to allow their women to vote. So we had the power of the Western states. In fact, you might know that Wyoming was the, the first to demand the right to vote if they were to be admitted to the Union. When the government said, no way, women don't have that kind of intelligence, women said, then we will not be a part of the United States. Well, there was a recap. Wyoming came into the United States with their women who voted. California, Oregon, all of these states that started becoming a part of the United States had women who could vote, but still there were not enough to convince their men, senators, and representatives to overturn the long-standing male-only privilege. Well, I looked at the National Association of Women Suffragists Movement under Carrie Chapman Camp. And I asked her, why did she insist on state by state? And she said, it's the way it has always been and it is the way it shall remain. I thought, hmm, not on my watch. Well, Lucy and I joined the NASA and asked to be assigned to a committee. The leaders determined that the office in Washington, D.C., they were headquartered in New York, and the leaders decided Washington, D.C. was a little outpost that didn't deserve much account so that we could be assigned to the Congressional Committee and take over Washington, D.C. We were given $10 and told to raise our own funds. Well, we did. We started raising money from well-meaning men and women who believed in our calling and our purpose and all went well. We achieved at the Cameron House along the Washington Square. 
we had volunteers coming in. We had money from wealthy widows to support our cause. And Mrs. Cat discovered our success and made it so miserable we had to return all the money to the major headquarters organization and we were kicked out of the National Association of Women's Suffragists. So along with the Western Allies who had the right to vote and were pressuring their representatives for Congress, we formed a new organization, the National Women's Association, and again raised money. And now I was free to attack the political power. It happened to be the Democrats at this time, but we would have attacked either party who were in power. We wanted to hold them accountable for a federal change to the right to vote instead of the state by state. I used my publicity stunts that I had learned in England and I was feared by the NASA because they knew I could be militant and disruptive. But Lucy Burns was the extrovert. She had flaming red hair. She was very tall and you would pick her out in any crowd whatsoever. And I was able to orchestrate things from behind the scenes with a strategy. I didn't choose to have any friends of the many volunteers, and I kept my private life very private. And I decided that Lucy would be the face of our success. We got along fairly well, but the government still ignored our pleas for the right to vote. We were heckled, we were shunned, we were laughed at, and finally we had a delegation who went to President Wilson. He was then in his first term in office. And we said, President Wilson, we know that you hold the autocratic power against Congress and we know that if you give the support for women's vote, they will pass it. He said, I don't meddle with Congress. They are a separate co-equal branch of government. Well, we knew better, but that was his stand. And then he had the audacity to walk out on us. We were there to discuss things and he would have nothing more to do with us. And if you've ever been walked out on at the time that you are fervently passionate about presenting a case, you know the affront. You know the boil inside of you to make a change. The next day, Seven women from the Cameron House at the headquarters of NWA arrived on the White House gates walkway. And we didn't say a word. We held signs that asked, President, how long must we wait for liberty? We started to use the president's words and then word world one came along and as had been done in the Civil War, all activities for the right of women to vote had ceased. Susan B. Anthony was against that, but she was overruled in the Civil War. I knew she was right, and we could not make that mistake again. <sighs> some of the pressures got to our volunteers, and some of them quit. 
because they couldn't take being labeled as traitors and treasons for lobbying against the president who was by then a wartime president. But we started to have more and more people coming in to join our ranks and we swelled. Well, President Wilson won a second term. We had been standing sentinel outside the Washington through winter and summer. Wilson had tipped his hat at us as he passed in his limousine. His daughter waved, but we still did not have his support. So what do you do when you're trying to make the President of the United States listen and acknowledge something as important as women's right to vote along with men? We stage a parade and upstage the President. I insisted that we have a flamboyant parade and go ahead of the president's inaugural parade. We had thousands of women from across the United States, from the Western states, every state, organizations, class were represented, and we had a special group of men. Now, sometimes you think it's all the women, but we couldn't have done any of it without men who supported us and we were ready to march at the head we had Inez Mill Holland uh, dressed all in white she was a gorgeous woman she was a socialite she was an accomplished lawyer in Washington and she rode a white horse at the head of our parade we struck out with dignity and purpose. We had asked for more police protection because the chief of police of Washington declared he could not protect us. And I said, well then put on more troops. He wanted us to change the route and not march up Pennsylvania ahead of the president. And I said, no way. So we started out, but the police were right. They could not protect us. The mobs broke through as the police stood, solidly silent. The mobs surrounded the marchers until we couldn't move. We had had vignettes placed along the parade route for additional showcase of arts and women. But they were lost because we couldn't march. We couldn't move. The rioting caused damage, injuries. And it was the Boy Scouts who stepped in to nurse the injured and it was the National Guard of Massachusetts and Pennsylvania who stepped in to bring order. Finally, we arrived at the end of our parade and people said, what a failure. I said, no way. Look at the publicity we've gotten. The whole country will hear about us. This was the best outcome that could have been. We have the ear and the attention of the United States of America. We continued our picketing through winter. We continued to resist the many, many arrests off of the picket line. They called us standing in front of the gates of, of the White House trespassers that we were on private property when we were on a public sidewalk and we had a legal right to protest. We were thrown into jail 
sometimes pardoned. Sometimes we were thrown into the workhouse where it was terrible. They asked us to please put on, now they didn't say please, they demanded that we put on the prisoner garb. We asked to be political prisoners and were denied that. Whitaker was particularly venomous. He was in charge of the workhouse. When we refused to wear the prisoner clothes and were stripped naked in front of the women guards and refused still to put on the prisoner clothes, they called in the men to dress us. That caused more publicity. That caused more outrage at the government. We had been arrested during our legal right to protest and we were humiliated. These were social women. These were educators. We had a woman who had written nursing textbooks. We had socialites whose husbands held powerful positions. We had the cream of the crop and the nation stood aghast that men had viewed our naked bodies. Again, food was a problem. We were given watered down gruel. We made a game to count how many worms were in the porridge. We kind of lost our zeal for the game when one of our prisoners reached 15 worms in one meal. So we went on a hunger strike. I came out from behind the scenes and joined the Sentinel where the police with glee arrested me and threw me for the longest sentence of seven months in the hard workhouse. What to do? Hunger strike. I was already weak, but I had the determination, along with the other women, that our spirit would not be weakened. I was sent to the psychiatrist where one word from the alienist could have put me into permanent lockup in a psychiatric ward. He refused. He declared that my commitment to a purpose was not insane. So I was held in the workhouse and force-fed just as I had been done in England. We had to have more publicity. We had to call in the American attention. And there were two men, a Dudley Malone and his friend, who were both lawyers who had taken our case against the government. They had argued in the court that we were political prisoners or that we were not guilty. And the judge declared that we had caused a scene at the White House, including when the Russian delegation had passed the Sentinels and had embarrassed the president because we had used the president's words against him. So the night of terror arrived and the guards with glee whipped and beat, kicked and degraded every one of the prisoners. But our spirit was not broken. Our prisoners were bruised and from the hunger strike there was a disorientation. 
You know, when you're on a hunger strike long enough, you lose even your ability to speak and remember. So the night of terror went into the morning and our lawyers, Dudley and O'Connor, had a writ of habeas corpus. They approached the West uh, Virginia court and demanded that Whitaker produce the prisoners so that the court could see the damage and judge for itself. Well, the day we arrived, after the night of terror, we were quite the spectacle. Bruised, battered, black eyes, injured arms, legs, hardly able to walk, disoriented. These were society's best women. The courthouse had the largest courtroom allocated to the hearing, and it was packed full of the citizens and the reporters. We arrived, and they saw. They saw what Whitaker had done to women who were peacefully protesting with their rights and beliefs in the right to vote. It was a hard way to go, but public opinion was definitely turning in our favor. The pictures of the bruised and battered women of refinement went across the nation. Finally, Wilson had to acknowledge and support the right to vote. He went to Congress and said, women are in fact doing work during the war so that our men can go to battle. Please, we want you to support the right to vote. Well, the amendment that had originally been called the Anthony Move uh, Amendment passed the Senate with flying colors and now lay siege under the House of Representatives. We ended up wondering, it was the War of the Roses. The anti-voters were red roses. The supporters were yellow roses. We had counted and counted and counted. We were one vote short. But Henry Burns of Tennessee had in fact gotten a letter from his mother urging him to support the women's suffragists. And so he changed his vote to support the right for women to vote and it passed. It passed the House of Representatives and was sent out to the states for ratification. Now I will quickly tell you that it went through the states and the ratification process was successful until it got to Tennessee. Tennessee, it passed their Senate but it, it languished in the House. It argued back and forth and back and forth. We needed that 36th state to ratify the right to vote to make it law. And now Carrie Chapman can't redeem herself. She came to Tennessee and for six weeks lived at the Hermitage Hotel soothing the egos and finally getting the vote to pass the House and the right to vote in the 19th Amendment became law. We were ecstatic. We had succeeded after 72 years. 
we had the right to vote. And now we had to educate women because they had been used to taking orders for their husbands and now they had to think for themselves and be responsible for the privilege. I went on and finished another PhD at Washington University here as one of my alma maters. I began writing the Equal Rights Amendment because I knew the right to vote was only the beginning. We would not be equal until the Constitution declared us as equal with all men. A ratification could be taken away, but a constitutional amendment for equality would be permanent. It is now a little over 50 years since we passed the right to vote. I have been lobbying for the Equal Rights Amendment since 1923. It finally passed both congressional houses last year in 1972 and has been sent out to the states for ratification. Unfortunately, they put a nine-year requirement on the ratification, that it would be null and void unless now 38 states ratified it within the nine years. I hope that you will take this privilege of voting and power of voting to your senators and representatives both in the state and the federal government because until we have equal rights in the Constitution we will not be equal. You have the future. You as the students have the power in your hands to make this a better world a better America and is now up to you. I have been fighting these fights for 79 years. Before me there have been other women who have given their lives for the rights for women. It is now your turn. Thank you. I will be glad to take any questions if there are such, either as Alice Paul or that has surfaced. Yes, photographs, yes, um, notes, letters. The prisoners actually were able to smuggle out messages that got to the lawyers because the Whitaker and the wardens would not allow their lawyers to even talk to their clients, the prisoners, and um, in, in preparing your question about research and so on, um, I, I did the performance of Alice Paul a little over a year ago and have a couple of times since then, um, but my father, who was a pastor, said he could never preach the same sermon twice. Um, because you have to feel it. And when we teach people in our institute for first-person performance, one of the struggles we have for people who are theater majors or thespians is there's nothing memorized. There's no script. You have to immerse yourself in the stories and become that person. And so I completely revamped everything for you today and so it needed to be fresh and uh, there is a lot of information we could go on for several days but I don't think Diane would let me <laughs> well it was great you, you. it was great anybody else if not I thank you for the privilege to be with you today.